Welcome to the video help with physics problems for Physics 1A. This video is going to cover homework set 3, part 1. It's going to cover the problems under the headings Momentum and Centre of Mass and Conservation of Momentum Collisions. So for 1, 1, 2, 1 students, this will cover questions 1 to 5 and the past exam question. For 1, 1, 3, 1 students, this will cover questions 1 to 7 and the past exam question. Problem 1. In this question, we're asked to find the velocity of the centre of mass for a system made up of three particles. The particles have different masses and different locations. Well, the location of the centre of mass is given by the sum of the masses of the particles in the system multiplied by the positions of the particles in the system over the total mass. Okay, so let's work this out for this system. We're given the location of each of the particles in terms of i, j and k. So the position of particle 1 is given by 5t in the i direction minus 2t squared in the j direction plus 3t minus 2 in the k direction. R2 has the location 2t minus 3 in the i direction plus 12 minus 5t squared in the j direction plus 4 plus 6t minus 3t cubed in the k direction and finally the position of 3 is given by 2t minus 1 in the i direction plus 2t plus 2j plus t, sorry, minus t cubed in the k direction. Okay, so let's work out the radius of the centre of mass, we need to consider the i, j and k components separately as they're all in completely different directions. m is the sum of the masses, so that's 2 plus 1 plus 3, which is 6. So r for the centre of mass is equal to 1, 6. Now we do 2 times this in the i direction, so that's 10t plus 2t minus 3. plus 3 times this, which is 6t minus 3, that's in the i direction. Then we consider our j direction, we've got 2 times this, so this is minus 4t squared, we've got this, plus 12 minus 5t squared, plus 3 times this. And then we've got our k direction, 2 times this, so 6t minus 4, plus 4 plus 6t minus 3t cubed, minus 3t cubed in the k direction. Okay, so let's try and simplify this a bit. 10t plus 2t, that's 12t, that's 18t minus 6 in the i direction plus we've got minus 4t squared minus 9t squared minus 6t squared plus 14j plus in the k direction we've got minus 6t cubed plus 12t and this minus 4 and 4 cancel out. So that's in the k direction. Okay, so we can divide everything by this 1 6. So we've got 3t plus 1 i minus t squared plus 14 on 6. So that what's that? 7 on 3 in the j direction minus t cubed plus 2t 
in the k direction. Okay, this should have been 3t squared plus 6, not plus 2. So instead of a 14, this is in fact an 18. 18 divided by 3 in fact gives us 3. So those are actually a bit nicer. Okay, now we're not asked to find the position of the center of mass, which is what we found now, but instead we've been asked to find the velocity. So to find the velocity, V of the center of mass is equal to dr dt of the center of mass. And so what we need to do is take the derivative of each of these with time. So this gives us 3i minus 2tj minus 3t squared plus 2. Okay, and we're told that t is equal to 1, so we can substitute this in. So our v for our center of mass is equal to 3i minus 2j minus 3 plus 2, so that's minus k. Okay, now part b asks us to find the momentum of the system at t equals 1. Well, the momentum for the system is just equal to the total mass times the velocity of the center of mass. And so we need to times this by 6 because the total mass is 6. So that gives us 18i minus 12j minus 6k as the total momentum for the system. Problem 2. In this problem, we have ammonia molecule, which consists of three hydrogen atoms. The hydrogen atoms are located on the corners of an equilateral triangle, with the centre of mass of the hydrogen atoms being in the centre of that equilateral triangle. Let's define the centre of mass of the hydrogen atoms as position 0, 0, 0 in I, J and K planes. Okay, we're told that the distance between the centre of triangle and each of these hydrogen atoms is 9.4 times 10 to the minus 11 metres. And the nitrogen atom is located above this equilateral triangle. And the distance between a hydrogen atom and the nitrogen atom is given by 10.14 times 10 to the minus 11 metres. Now the question asks us, relative to the nitrogen atom, where is the centre of mass of the system? Well, we can see clearly for the three hydrogen atoms that the centre of mass is at location 0, 0, 0. The nitrogen atom is located directly above this centre of mass. So in the I and J plane, it's going to be at 0, 0. And then we should work out the distance this nitrogen atom is above the centre of mass. So to do that, we'll need to use Pythagoras' theorem. Here's the centre of mass, here's the nitrogen atom. We know that this distance is 9.4 times 10 to the minus 11. This distance is 10.14 times 10 to the minus 11. And so using Pythagoras' theorem, this distance is 10.14 squared minus 9.4 squared times 10 to the minus 11. And solving it on the calculator, we get that this is 3.80 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. Okay, so the equation for the center of mass is that it is equal to the sum of the masses times the distance from a given position over the sum of the masses. Okay, so we can consider these three hydrogen atoms all together as one object because their center of mass is at zero, zero. So this is three times the mass of hydrogen, but their distance from our zero point is zero because we've defined that as zero. And then we've got to add in the mass of the nitrogen. We're told in the question that the nitrogen molecule is 13.9 times the mass of a hydrogen molecule. And it's in the I and J planes, it, it doesn't have a contribution that's 0, 0. So, and K is 3.8 times 10 to the minus 11. 
So this is um, times 3.8 times 10 to the minus 11 K. This is zero here. And then the total mass is three times the mass of hydrogen for these three hydrogens, plus the 13.9 times the mass of hydrogen for the nitrogen. Okay, so our mass of hydrogens will all cancel out. This entire term is zero. Solving this on the calculator, we end up with 3.125 times 10 to the minus 11 meters, and that's in the K direction. So the center of mass is 3.125 times 10 to the minus 11 meters above the center of mass of the hydrogen molecules. Now that is not exactly what the question asks us for. The question asks us for locate the center of mass relative to the nitrogen atom. So we should give it below this nitrogen atom. So to do that, we do 3.80 minus 3.125 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. And that gives us 0 0.675 times 10 to the minus 11 meters below the nitrogen atom. in direction of plane of H atoms. Okay, so that's the final answer to this question. This is a 1131 only problem. It's problem three. Okay, in this problem we have a hot air balloon. And it's got a ladder hanging below it and we've got a brave man climbing the ladder and the man climbs the ladder with speed V so he's going up the ladder with speed B the balloon has a mass capital M the man has a mass little m and we're told that initially relative to the ground this entire system is stationary so relative to ground stationary which implies that initially it does not have momentum at least relative to the ground now we're asked when the man begins to climb how's this balloon going to move with respect to the earth well, the momentum of the system is not going to change because there's no external forces acting on the system. So we know that zero will equal um, the mass of the man times the velocity of the man. Now, this is all relative to the Earth. So as the man goes up, the balloon's going to have to go down. So let's assume that it goes down with speed capital V. So the momentum of the man relative to the ground will in fact be little v, this little v, minus the big V. And then the momentum of the balloon, it will be moving down, so it will be minus M capital V. This is a capital M capital V. So this is a downwards momentum, this one will be upwards, and these will have to be balanced. Okay, so we're asked to calculate this big V here. So let's rearrange this equation. Let's, we can write this as M capital V, that's moving this term over to this side, plus capital M capital V is equal to M little v. Okay, so taking capital V out as a common factor, and we end up with capital V is equal to MV over little m plus big M. So this V is the velocity relative to the ground and this will be downwards. Okay, now in part B, that was part A, it says what will be the state of movement when the man stops moving. When the man's stationary, we can put little v into this equation. So this is V times big V is equal to M times zero over M plus M, so that is zero. So that's how we could solve it mathematically. Otherwise, I mean intuitively, it initially had no momentum, 
So the the total momentum is always zero. So if the man's not moving, then the balloon's not moving, and so it's stationary. So the answer to this is stationary. Or big V equals zero. This is problem three for one one two one or four for one one three one. In this problem, we have a ball heading towards the floor. Just before it hits the floor, it has a speed of 25 meters per second. Just after it rebounds from the floor, it has a speed of 10 meters per second upwards in the opposite direction. Part A says, what is the Im what impulse acts on the ball during contact? Well, impulse is equal to the force times the time, and it's also equal to the change in momentum. So delta P, which is M. V final minus V initial. Okay, so to work out the impulse, we need to use this equation in this case. So this is equal to the mass, which is 1.0 kilograms, times the final velocity, which is 10, we'll take upwards as positive, minus the initial velocity, which is minus 25. And so 10 minus minus 25 is going to be 35 times 1. So this will just be 35 newtons per second, or kilogram meters per second if you want, which, whichever units, both are fine. Okay, part B then says if the ball is in contact, so T is equal to 0 0.020 seconds, What's the average force exerted on the floor? Okay, so now we can use this part of the equation. So the force times the time is equal to 35. And so the force is equal to 35 over 0 0.020. Solving this on the calculator, we end up with 1,750. This is three significant figures, so we can write this as 1,800 Newton upwards. This is problem four for 1121 or five for 1131. In this problem, we have a frictionless table and we have two masses on it. We have mass one, which is 1.88 kilograms and it's moving in this direction with a speed of 10.3 meters per second. And then we have a second mass over here, M2 which has a mass of 4.92 kilograms and is moving in the same direction at 3.27 meters per second. Now you can see this one's going faster, so it's going to catch up to mass two. And attached to mass two is a spring. The spring has a spring constant K is equal to 11.2 newtons per centimeter. So we can write this as 1120 newtons per meter. Okay, and the question asks us when the what is the maximum compression of the spring when the blocks collide? There's a couple of steps to answering this question. To work out the compression, we're actually going to need to consider the energies involved. But to work out the energies involved when the spring is compressed, we're going to need to know what speed everything's traveling at so that we know the kinetic energy. So first of all, we use conservation of momentum. So the initial momentum of the system is M1U1 plus M2U2. And then when the spring is compressed, we know that the blocks M1 and M2 are together traveling as one. We're assuming that the spring's massless, so we don't need, to, well, the mass of the spring is included in mass two, so we don't need to consider it separately. And they're traveling together, so they have the same speed, V. So we need to solve this to work out V. So V is equal to M1, so 1.88 times 10.3 plus 4.92 times 3.27 all over M1 plus M2, so 1.88 plus uh, 4.92. Solving that on the calculator, we end up with 5.2136 meters per second. Obviously, it's going to be going in that direction. Okay, now we're told this is frictionless. 
which implies that we have no non-conservative forces. So total energy is constant. So that tells us that the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy, which is, well, well there's no form of potential energy here that we need to consider there, is equal to the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy. Here the potential energy will be stored in the spring, so in the compression of the spring. So we've got a half m1u1 squared plus a half m2u2 squared is equal to one half m1 plus m2, they're stuck together as one and they're moving with speed v, plus a half kx squared, this is the potential energy of the spring. Let's cancel out all the halves. And now we substitute in the numbers, 1.88 times 10.3 squared plus 4.92 times 3.27 squared is equal to 1.88 plus 4.92 times 5.2136 squared plus k 1120 times x squared. We need to solve this for x squared. This side is equal to 252.058. This term is equal to 184 plus 1120 times x squared. Solving that on the calculator, we get x squared is equal to 0 0.06002. And so x is equal to 0 0.24499 meters, which is equal to 24.5 centimeters. So that's the final answer to this problem. This is problem 5 for 1121 or 6 for 1131. In this problem, we have a recoiling nucleus. This nucleus is recoiling because it's decayed and as it decayed it has emitted an electron with momentum equal to 1.2 times 10 to the minus 22 kilogram meters per second and a neutrino at right angles to this electron with momentum 6.4 times 10 to the minus 23 kilogram meters per second. We're asked to find the direction and the magnitude of the momentum of the recoiling nucleus. Let's define the direction of the recoiling nucleus as the negative x direction. So let's, let's extend this line and let's make the angle that the electron makes with the recoiling nucleus this angle theta. Okay, the the angle between the recoiling electron and the nucleus is 180 minus theta, not theta, but we'll define theta this way because it makes it easier for us. Now, as all the momentum of the nucleus is just in the horizontal direction, the x direction, we know that the momentum of the electron and the neutrino in the y direction must cancel each other out, as otherwise the recoiling nucleus would have to have some in the y direction as well for conservation of momentum. So we have, these have to be equal and opposite. This is theta, so this side is PE sine theta. Now this is 90 degrees here, so this angle is 90 minus theta. She tells us that this angle down here is theta, and this is p mu sine uh, cos theta. And we know that these two have to be equal to each other, because they're opposite in sine equal in magnitude. So we have p e sine theta is equal to p mu cos theta. Okay, doing some simple trigonometry, sine theta divided by cos theta gives us tan theta. So tan theta is equal to p mu over p e. These are the momentums which we've got the values for. So this is 6.4 times 10 to the minus 23 over 1.2 times 10 to the minus 22. Solving that on the calculator for with the inverse tan theta gives us Theta is equal to 28.07 degrees. 
Okay, now we know that for this system, the horizontal components also add to zero. So this, the magnitude of the nucleus's momentum must be equal to the magnitude of the horizontal component of the electron's momentum and the neutrino's momentum. So horizontal components of momentum add to zero. So we have that the momentum of the nucleus is equal to the momentum of the electron times cos theta plus the electron of the new the momentum of the neutrino times sine theta. Substituting in our values, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 22 times cos of 28.07 plus 6.4 times 10 to the minus 23 times sine of 28.07. So Entering all this on the calculator gives us 1.36 times 10 to the minus 22, and that's kilograms meters per second. Now everything up here is to two significant figures, so let's give this to two significant figures. It's 1.4 times 10 to the minus 22 kilogram meters per second. And then we're asked to give a direction. So if we give the angle between the electron and the nucleus, that's a good way to describe it. So this is 28 degrees, this is 180 minus 28 degrees, so that's 152 degrees. So we can put at 150 degrees, two significant figures from the electron. And this diagram is very useful in making it very clear what angle we're talking about. Okay, we're on to part B now. In part B, we're told that the mass of the nucleus is equal to 5.8 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. And we're asked what's its kinetic energy. Okay, well, we know that kinetic energy is equal to a half mv squared. But we can actually change this formula a bit, rearrange it a bit to make it easier for us because we have a value for the momentum of the nucleus and momentum is equal to mv. So we can write the kinetic energy as a half p squared over m because this is m squared v squared and then there's only one m here so we need to divide by an m. So we have this value, we're told this value so now it's easy. So we've got a half, the momentum we calculated is 1.36, let's save an extra significant figure. And the mass is 5.8 times 10 to the minus 26. Okay, so entering all that onto the calculator, we end up with 1.59 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So that would be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules if we were to answer in joules. But um, another unit of energy is the electron volt, and one electron volt is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. This is the same magnitude as the charge on an electron. So this is actually just equal to 1.0 electron volts. So that's another way to answer this question. Either of those is fine. We're now up to problem 7 for 1131 only. Okay, in this problem we have two masses. We have one with mass little m and one with mass big M and they're moving towards each other. Initially they're at rest, so let's give this one speed v naught is equal to zero and speed capital V naught is equal to zero. And initially they're a large distance apart, so um, initially d is approximately infinity. Okay, and we're asked when their separation is given by d, what is the, the relative speed of approach? And we're told to think about whether the momentum and energy are conserved. So there's no external forces acting on this system. The only force acting on it is gravity caused by the mass of the objects. There's no additional forces do any, doing any work. So that tells us that momentum is conserved.
and also that the total mechanical energy. Okay, so momentum is conserved. Now the initial momentum is zero because the initial speed of both objects is zero. So that tells us that little m little v plus capital M capital V is equal to zero. Notice that they're moving in opposite directions, so one of these will have a positive sign and one a negative sign. Okay, so let's call that equation one. Okay, the mechanical energy is also conserved, so that tells us that the initial potential energy plus the initial kinetic energy is equal to the final potential energy plus the final kinetic energy. Now, the initial potential energy, they're at a distance of approximately, like an um, enormous distance to start with, so we can take the limit as the distance goes to infinity. So the potential energy is given by gm m over r, where r is the distance. If r is infinity, then this is approximately zero. So this is zero. The kinetic energy is also zero because both these masses have speed zero, so that's zero. Now the final potential energy between these two masses, they're at a distance d from each other. So this is given by g little m big m over d plus the kinetic energy of the two matters, so a half mv squared plus a half big M big V squared. Okay, so let's call this equation 2. Now what we're asked to find is the relative velocity between the two. So the relative velocity is equal to the little v, which is going in this direction, minus big V, which is going in that direction. Okay, so what we need to do now is find little v and big V so that we have the relative velocity. We can rearrange equation 1 here to give us little v is equal to minus big B, big M, big V over little m. And now we can use substitute this back into equation 2. So let's rearrange equation 2 here. We've got G M m on d, this term, is equal to a half m, now little v squared, so that's minus m, big m, big v, over little m squared, plus a half big m, big v squared. Let's get rid of these halves, so we can cancel the halves and put the 2 up here, times both sides by 2. And now let's simplify this a bit. We've got 2g little m big m on d is equal to... Okay, so this one, when we square it, we get rid of the negative sign. So it's big m squared big v squared over little m. This is an m squared, so this m cancels with one of those. Plus big m big v squared. Taking big v squared out as a common factor, we have big M squared over little m plus big M. Okay, so now we want to rearrange this. Let's do that up here. What we're trying to find is this V squared. So V squared is equal to. Now there's a big M here, a big M here, and a big M there. So let's just cancel those out when we write it out. So we've got G M and R2 on D, and then we've got to divide by this term here. So this is M on little m plus 1. Okay, to make it neater, let's times the top and the bottom by little m. So we've got 2G little m squared over D big M plus little m. And that is our expression for big V squared. Now, rather than solve it again, we could do exactly the same thing, replacing the little v with big V. So, because there's so much symmetry here, we can see that if we replace little m with big M and little v with big V, we'll solve it exactly equivalently. So, we can conclude that little v squared is going to be, we just need to replace the little m's with big M's, 2g big M squared over d little m plus big m. 
Okay, now what we've got to do is work out what is little v minus big V. Okay, so just to recap, we ended up with big V squared was equal to 2G little m squared over D big M plus little m. And little v squared was equal to 2G big M squared over D little m plus big M. And we're trying to find the relative velocity, which is given by v minus v. And these were in opposite directions. Okay, so little v, we'll just find out these, is equal to big M root 2g dm plus m. And we can take the positive or the negative root because it's going in this direction. We'll define this direction as positive. So the positive root is the correct solution to this equation. And for big V, we've got little m root 2g over dm plus m. And in this case, it's going in the opposite direction. So we want to take the negative root as the solution for this one. So our relative velocity is equal to big M, we, we, these are a common factor, so we can actually write these out here, 2G over D M plus M. So this is big M minus minus little m, so this is equal to big M plus little m root 2G over root D m plus m. Now this root and this root will cancel, that will give that a half and so we end up with 2g m plus m over root d which is what we were asked to show. Past exam question. Okay, in the first part of this question we're told that a student stands on some scales, the scales read her mass is 60 kilograms and inside those scales is a spring and the spring compresses 5 millimetres. So that's 5.0 times 10 to the minus 3 metres. We're asked to calculate the spring constant. So this is part 1. Okay, well, when the spring is compressed, the student is applying a force downwards mg on that spring. This spring is balanced, this, this force is balanced by the force from the spring. So we have mg is equal to kx. We're trying to find k, so k is equal to mg on x. The mass of the student is 60 kilograms. The g is 9.8 and x is 5.0 times 10 to the minus 3 millimetres because we've converted from millimetres to metres. Okay, so now all we need to do is enter this into the calculator. When we do that, we get k is equal to 117600. Okay, way too many significant figures here. All this is only to two significant figures. So we can write this as 1.2 times 10 to the 5 newtons per metre. Newtons per meter is the units for K. Okay, now the student does a dangerous experiment where they put the scales on the wall, they attach a block to the front of the scales. This block has mass capital M equal to 10 kilograms. When she attaches this block to the scales, the scales read zero. She then shoots a bullet which weighs 6 grams, 6.0 grams, at this block. The bullet gets fully embedded in the block and she knows that the muzzle velocity, so the initial velocity of this bullet, is equal to 400 metres per second. And we're told to show all our working and to calculate how much the spring compresses. We need to state any assumptions that we make when we do this. A common mistake in this problem would be to assume that all this kinetic energy in the bullet is converted into potential energy in the spring. 
that is not correct because you're going to lose some of this kinetic energy to sound and other sources as the the bullet embeds and so the total initial kinetic energy in the bullet is not equal to the potential energy in the spring a more valid assumption to make is that the momentum in the bullet is converted into momentum in the block from that we'll be able to calculate the kinetic energy of the block and the kinetic energy of the block does get converted into the potential energy in the spring at least much more efficiently than the kinetic energy from the bullet does. Okay, so um, assumption, momentum is conserved. So there we're obviously assuming that there's no external forces acting on this system. We're ignoring air resistance and things like that. So we've got little m, V, that's the initial momentum. This block initially has no momentum. V naught, let's call it, is equal to... Okay, now when the bullet embeds in the block, it's all one system. So the mass of that system is little m plus big M. And the final velocity, let's call it capital V. That's the velocity of the bullet and the block combined. Okay, so this is 6 times 10 to the minus 3 times 400 is equal to... Now, this is 6 grams. This is 10 kilograms. This is a tiny mass in comparison to that. So we can actually save ourselves some effort and ignore this little m as it's so tiny. So that's 10 times the final velocity. So solving this on the calculator, we end up with the final velocity of the bullet and block combined is equal to 0 0.24 meters per second. Okay, now what we assume that the kinetic energy in the block plus the bullet is converted into potential energy in the spring. Which makes sense because this block and bullet are going to come to rest against the scales. So all that kinetic energy is going to go into stored energy within the spring. So this shouldn't be too loud. There shouldn't be many other forms of energy loss. Okay, so the kinetic energy in the block plus bullet is given by a half, what, m plus m. But this is tiny, so we can ignore it. V squared, and this is, goes into the kinetic potential energy in the spring. So we've got a half m plus m v squared is equal to a half kx squared. Let's cancel out our halves, ignore this little m. And so we've got 10 kilograms times v squared, which was the 0.24 squared, is equal to k. Now we calculated our spring constant. It was 1.176 times 10 to the 5 and x squared. We're trying to find the compression of the spring, this x. So we can enter this into the calculator. When we do that, we get x squared is 4.89796 times 10 to the minus 6. And so x is equal to 2.2 times 10 to the minus 3 meters to three, two significant figures. Or we could write as 2.2 millimeters. Okay, now part 3 says calculate the reading on the scale at this point. Okay, so this scale is just calibrated to convert that compression into a mass. So the mass, the equivalent mass, mg is equal to kx. We're trying to work out m. So m is equal to 1.176 times 10 to the 5 times the 2.2 times 10 to the minus 3 over 9.8. Solving that on the calculator, we end up with 27. 
So this is 27 kilograms. So that, according to the scales, is equivalent to 27 kilograms.